Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, and we're going to pick up in verse uh, 7. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 7, we saw the doubt of John the Baptist last week and Jesus resolving that doubt. I mentioned this a little bit, but I'm going to just mention it uh, a little bit more right now. I won't get to say this in the sermon, but it, it's, it's just stunning to me that after John the Baptist doubts Jesus, Jesus basically preaches an entire sermon to the crowd defending John's character. Wouldn't that be amazing if that's how we treated all of our fellow Christians? Whenever we heard them slandered, or even we heard something true and weak about them, we were ready to jump in and say, well, let me tell you about all their virtues. Let me tell you about who they are at the core of their being. Jesus preaches a sermon on the greatness of John the Baptist right after he's seen John the Baptist's worst weakness. And then he goes on to tell us the two things we'll explore this morning tells us about what is, what makes human beings great, and what makes human beings damned. So let's read from Matthew chapter 11, verse 7 and following. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go into the wilderness to see, a reed shaken by the wind? No, John was not fickle. What then did you go in to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? No, John was not soft. Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What then did you go in to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, that's what you saw with John the Baptist, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, that's just a Hebrew way of saying among all people, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of God has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. But what shall I, but to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you. You didn't dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking. They say he has a demon. Son of man came eating and drinking, and they said, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. Then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done. Because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to the heavens? You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. This is God's word. Father, we come again. We ask you now to please pour out your anointing Holy Spirit that gives wisdom, illumination, insight, warmth, spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you. And we pray that you'd give that to this weak preacher and this weak people as we tremble under your word. We pray that you do this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to ask you two questions this morning. 
two questions. And the questions have the power to reshape our perspective on life and on eternity. And the first question is, what makes a person great? What makes a person great? How do you know if you're great? How do you know if the people you looked up to are great? Are the friends you want to impress actually great? Or I was thinking about this, I was thinking, you know, this is an important question, but the honest truth is most of us probably don't lay in bed going, am I great? At least I hope not. And if you are, you really need this sermon. <laughs> but have you ever asked yourself, maybe you haven't asked the question directly, but you've asked yourself, am I doing anything worthwhile? Probably ask that to ourselves. Ever wondered if your life was good or significant or evil and insignificant? We've asked ourselves, am I making a difference? And those are just really subtle ways of asking ourselves about our greatness. We don't want to be insignificant. We want to be significant. We don't want to make no difference. We want to make a difference. We want to be good and make a difference. We don't want to be evil and mess people up. In one way, shape, or form, we've all asked ourselves, what makes a person great? And all around us, we see different ways of measuring greatness. The Olympics is one way of measuring greatness in terms of just what you're doing. Who can go the highest? Who can go the fastest? Who is the strongest? But we know at the end of the day, that beach volleyball and epic shot put performances, shot put guys are amazing. It's like Norwegian gods doing ballet. <laughs> it's just, it's unbelievable. But no one thinks of the measure of ultimate greatness. This November, we'll go to the pol polls and elect a new president the winner will have great power. They will be called the leader of the free world and the commander in chief of the greatest army ever raised. We should be praying for a righteous leader to be given. But we all know that great power is not the essence of greatness, don't we? History is full of a long list of bad men and women who've had tremendous power. Ah, sometimes we think brains, brains are gonna make us great. Get a degree, be smart, get all A's. And you, know, you look at Stephen Hawking and Albert Einstein, the two greatest physicists that have lived in the last 100 years, and their family lives are a disaster. We know that great brains and academic accolades can't add up to ultimate greatness. Now, some people hear all these kind of things, the Olympics, get degrees, become the president, and they, they, re they react with ordinary. It's the ordinary men and women who are truly great. It's not about winning elections, not about winning medals, it's not about getting degrees, it's about being ordinary. The ordinary are great. Men who provide for their families for 40 years and then have a heart attack and die. That's great. Women who serve their kids till they die. That's what's truly great. And I can get behind that. I'd say that caring for your kids for 40 years is at least as good as a good triple jump. I think that's, I think that's good. But most of the worst people you've ever met have been ordinary people. We've all got family relationships where we whisper about that aunt and uncle and the terrible things they did to their children or the cousins. Ordinary people are not automatically great people. Being obscure doesn't make you awesome. Other times people, they want a story. It doesn't matter what it is, just some story, some personal story, some personal adversity. I went and I did something great. I sailed the seven seas or I ranched out in the west, whatever it may be. But there's lots of people with amazing stories who aren't great. So in this passage, we read who Jesus thinks the greatest is. We get Jesus' perspective on 
greatness. I imagine you noticed that Jesus tells us who he thinks is great. He tells us about one individual who he calls the goat, the greatest of all time. And then he speaks of a group of people who are so great that even the least of them are greater, greater than the greatest man who ever lived. Well, let's think for a minute about who these people are. The first person Jesus calls great is John the Baptist. He says, among those born of women, none is greater than John the Baptist. And there's lots of people in the Bible we don't know a lot about, but John's not one of them. We know who his family was. He was a cousin of Jesus. We know what his vocation was. He was a preacher like Jesus who would preach the same message, could be summed up as repent and believe for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We know historically who John was. Even though John comes to us in the pages of what we call the New Testament, the part of the Bible written after Jesus was born and lived and died, even though Jesus, John comes to us in the pages of the New Testament, he is rightly regarded as the last of the Old Testament prophets. You should think Jeremiah, Isaiah, Daniel, John. And the reason I say that is because in Matthew 11, verse 13, in our passage, we read, for all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. God was doing one thing, in a sense, prophetically, through the law and the prophets until John. When he prophesied through Moses, when he prophesied through Isaiah, when he prophesied through Jeremiah, when he prophesied through John, he was doing one thing primarily, and that's this. He was saying, I'm going to send a Savior. I'm going to send a Messiah. I'm going to send a king. All of those prophets, they said many things, but they all had that burden. And they did it from the days of Moses writing the law, through all of the big prophetic books like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, right up until John. But John was different than all the Old Testament prophets. Don't miss this. John was different than all the Old Testament prophets. What made John different than all the Old Testament prophets? Well, Moses told us in the book of Genesis that there would be a Savior or there would be a Messiah through whom everyone would be blessed. Isaiah said, he will be pierced for our transgressions. By his wounds will be healed. Jeremiah said, he'll bring a new covenant which will bring the forgiveness of sins and it'll make it so all God's people know God. John said, that's him. It was a distinct ministry because of its closeness, because of its proximity, because of the fact that John wasn't looking forward hundreds of years to tell you in a sketch what Jesus would be like. John was literally, he wasn't even painting a picture that was a perfect representation of Jesus. John was literally walking up to Jesus and telling people, this is the one. And that's why he is the consummation of the end of the Old Testament prophets. Because he finally comes to the very end of what all the Old Testament prophets were meant to do. Point people to Jesus Christ. We know this about John again from our passage, Matthew chapter 11, verse 10. There's a passage, there's a passage there that's a quote from the prophet Malachi, and it's a quote that tells us what John did. Behold, I, God the Father, send my messenger before your face, Jesus, who I will prepare, who will prepare your way before you. John is the messenger who literally prepares people for face-to-face -face introductions to Jesus. So, what makes a person great? Jesus calls two people great. One, an individual, John the Baptist. The other, these people called the kingdom of heaven. We've seen who John the Baptist was. Let's look at who the people of the kingdom of heaven are. Matthew tells us a lot about them. The kingdom of heaven is the kingdom of those who believe in Jesus. It's Christians, just to put it as simply as I possibly can. Those who are citizens of the kingdom of heaven are believers. They are Christians. They are those who've been broken over their sins and see that they have nothing in their soul to offer to God. 
That's why we read in Matthew chapter 5 that blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Who is part of the kingdom of heaven? It's those who have a poverty of spirit. It's those who don't wake up every morning and say, I'm awesome and I'm going to do something for God. They're those who wake up every morning and see that they have nothing to offer to God and anything that happens for them from God must come from him. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Who are the people in the kingdom of heaven? Matthew 5.10. Blessed are those who persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The people in the kingdom of heaven are the people who so closely identify with Jesus that they get treated like Jesus, that they get scowled at like Jesus or harmed like Jesus. They are, at the end of the day, the people that Jesus calls the members of the kingdom of heaven and great in the kingdom of heaven. Now this begs the question. This is just warm up. Why are they great? Why is John the Baptist great? He just doubted God. Why is the kingdom of heaven people great? Some of them are apparently less than others. He says there's people who are least in the kingdom of heaven. So they aren't even all equally awesomely perfect. Why are John the Baptist and the people of the kingdom of heaven, Christians, called great. Now, whenever you have greatness debates, you have to ask, what is the standard? Uh, like basketball, and I really have no dog in this fight. What's the standard? What makes the greatest player of all times? If it's rings, it's Michael Jordan. If it's statistics, it's LeBron James. You've got to ask, what is the standard before you can ask, who's the greatest? You got to know what the standard is before you can know who the greatest is. And the greatness of a person, listen to this, hold on to this. The greatness of a person or a thing is related to how well it accomplishes the task for which it was created. Let me say that again. The greatness of a person or thing is related to how well it accomplishes the task for which it was created. If you enter a quilt into an IndyCar race, it will not do well. Because quilts were not meant to perform well in IndyCar races. They don't have engines. They're just beautiful and comfy. And of course, races are not gauged. They, don't, they aren't judged. You don't judge grace, graceness by beautiful company. Now, if you enter a quilt into a contest, say, at the, we have the greatest quilt. Um, this is one of Kentucky's claim to fame. We have a great quilt museum on the western side of our state. And in Paducah, you can find great quilts. And of course, it's great because it accomplishes what it was meant to do. Some of you are paying $40 a month so that your child can have a saxophone. And that saxophone has great potential. It has great potential. The one you're paying $40 a month for has, has, has some potential. It has, has a lot of potential to squeak and squawk in the hands of an unexpert, untrained player. If you have boys and they decide they will play with the saxophone outside of the case and they bend the thing in half and you're buying the whole thing, the saxophone is no longer great for what it was meant to do. Because a thing is great based on what it was meant to do and how well it accomplishes what it was meant to do. You with me? You and I were made to display God. From the very earliest pages of the Bible, we are told that our purpose is to put God on display. Genesis chapter 1, God makes man in his image and his likeness. We were made to be the image of God, like a sculpture portrays the heart of an artist, or like a painting shows the passion of an artist, we were meant to be like sculptures or paintings that display what God is like, except that we're not deaf sculptures and we're not immovable paintings. We are living, created beings with minds like God and bodies that can express the embrace of God or the rejection of God. We are people who have been made in his image and in his 
likeness. We were meant in everything we do to display God. Our culture says that the main reason you were made was so that you could express you, so that you find out what's deep down in there, and whatever you find, you spend your life putting it on display. But that is not what the Bible says. What the Bible says is that we were meant to display the character of God. We were meant to apprehend the mind of God. We were to think his thoughts after him. We were to feel the heart of God. We were to act like God in the world. This is what we were made for. It is the essence of who we are. And John the Baptist did what no other man up until him had done. He pointed to the fullness of the reality of God in Jesus Christ. Another way of saying what I'm saying is the Psalms often use this language. They say, magnify the Lord with me. You ever taken a picture of someone on your phone and then you take those two fingers and open it up so you can magnify the image that you've just created? Our lives are meant to do that. The more a person does that with our lives and magnifies the image of our life, the more they should see God. We were meant to put God on display. Or to use New Testament language from 1 Peter. You, beloved, are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. We're made in the image of God. We're made in the likeness of God. We're made to magnify God. We are made to proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, in one sense, that actually doesn't make you special. Because actually everything that God made is meant to proclaim the glory of God. The heavens declare the glory of God. But a rock doesn't have a mind like you've got a mind. A blade of grass does not have a heart like you've got a heart. And you were meant to be a being who can apprehend all that God is and that can speak truth about who God is. That is what you were meant for. And when John the Baptist looks at Jesus in John and says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Or in the book of Matthew, he says, this is the very face of God. I've prepared people for him. He is doing what every human being was ever meant to do. He's magnifying God He's pointing to God. He's displaying God with his very life. And Jeremiah said, I think this is what, he didn't say I think, but sketch-wise, this is what God will be like. Isaiah said, this is what God will be like. But John looked at Jesus and said, that's exactly what God will be like. And so he's the greatest person who ever lived, not because he never doubted, not because he never sinned, but because he did what human beings were made to do. He pointed to who God is and who God is in his fullness in Jesus Christ. Now listen to this. What I've said about John is pretty amazing, but what's even more amazing is that Jesus tells us that the one who is the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. Do you remember that little old lady from Sunday school who you don't remember? I'm not talking about the little old lady from Sunday school that you do remember. I'm talking about the one behind her that you don't remember. The one who didn't even feel confident enough to put the stuff on the flanograph because there was another lady doing it. The one who only showed up half the times because she was sick. You just can't remember her name for the life of you. I'll just tell you one thing about her. She's greater than all the Old Testament prophets. This This forgotten, unknown, least of these Christian is greater than the greatest of all the Old Testament 
prophets. Why? Because greatness is not determined by anything you do, but by who you know. Because greatness is not determined by anything you bring to the table, but what you see about what God has brought to the table for your salvation. That's what makes a person great. You think about this. In in church history, there have been great names. The Apostle Paul, Augustine, Luther. Then there's lesser names. Tychicus, Melanchthon. Then there's even lesser names. Martha, Bob, what was his name? There's the people who Paul forgot he baptized. You ever read that in 1 Corinthians? Whether I baptized any of you, I do not know. It's just all a blur to me now. But Paul, it was my baptism. I'm sorry, I've forgotten. One of the worst thoughts as a preacher is you're like, did I do their wedding? Oh, it's the worst. It's the worst. What we're being told here is that people in that least of these forgotten positions are greater than the greatest of all the Old Testament prophets. And it's not necessarily because they did killer devotions that would have beat any of the Old Testament prophets. It's because they know and serve Jesus Christ. John knew that Jesus was the promised Messiah. John knew that Jesus was the one of whom God said, behold my son with whom I am well pleased. John heard but didn't see from much what we can tell that Jesus did many miracles. And John died before Jesus died on the cross. He never lived to see Jesus die on the cross. John was in heaven by the time Jesus rose from the dead. John was long gone from planet earth by the time he ascended to the right hand of the Father to then give the Holy Spirit to the least of the kingdom of heaven. John didn't see any of that, but you know all of that stuff. You know all of the great, marvelous moves of God in redemption. You know that there isn't just some promised Messiah, but his name is Jesus. That he healed the sick, that he healed the lame, that he adopts sinners as his children, that he justifies the ungodly, that he died as a ransom for sinners, that he rose to conquer death, that he ascended where he rules and reigns above kings, and and he's the king of kings, and he's the Lord of lords. You know that he's coming back to judge the living and the dead. You know all of that. And even on the days when you can barely hold on to it, and maybe you even experience some doubt about it, you know more about God's glorious salvation than even the most glorious of Old Testament prophets. And because what you were made for was to know God, that constitutes your greatness. Your greatness is in what you know about God. God, and that's marvelous if you're humble enough to accept it, right? Because now we're getting into a moral issue. Do I really want that to be great? I mean, it's, you're great. Yeah, I'm great. What makes me great? Nothing about me. Uh, do I want that? So let me ask you that. Some of you are doing pretty well in business. Some of you are just faithful in whatever path God's given you. Some of you got some kids that are looking like they might shape up to make you look awesome. Others of you are thinking about where you can send them so you don't look quite as bad as you do. What is it you're relying on to make you great? Listen to the Apostle Paul. Listen to what the Apostle Paul said about what made him great. And this was a smart man. I mean, there's libraries filled with writings based on the writings of the Apostle Paul. This is a smart man. This is a mobilized man. This is an influential man. Listen to what Paul says about himself. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh, I got reason to think I'm a pretty good guy. I got reason to brag. I got reason to boast. I got reasons to think, humanly speaking, that God would think I'm something special. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh, also if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. 
circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel. I'm from a good tribe, the tribe of Benjamin. I'm not just some Hebrew. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to the righteousness under the law, blameless. I did it good. I was a good guy by legal standards. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, which is a crummy word, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness that depends on faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Paul, you are awesome. What makes you awesome? Nothing about me. Paul, you've planted churches all over the known world. You've really really maximized your uh, influence What makes you awesome? I don't even have a righteousness of my own. It's all Christ's righteousness. What do you want to make yourself known a little bit to help influence people? What I want to know is I want to know him. I want to make sure I attain to the resurrection from the dead, trusting and following him. That's what makes me great. And the most unheard of, insignificant believer who shares even a mustard seed of that same faith is great beyond John the Baptist. They are great because they were made to know God and they do know God. And they have been given the inestimable privilege of actually being able to speak about God to others. There are no little places. There are no little people, said Francis Schaeffer. There are only great Christians with a great God. Now we could glory in this all day, and we will glory in this for all eternity, but we must turn and ask ourselves a second question. What makes a man damnable? What makes a small, insignificant, sinful, and even Unworthy, what makes a small sinful man worthy of damnation and condemnation in hell? Jesus speaks to this question as well. Verse 20 and 21 of our passage. Then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done. He began to denounce cities where most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. And then he denounces two of them as an example for us, Chorazin and Bethsaida. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. And I want you to notice that this denouncing is a damnation. Because this word woe means to be damned. It's the opposite of to be blessed. To be under God's blessing is to be under his smile and salvation. To be under his woe is to be under his damnation. Ue, which is the word, can mean doom, this is D.A. Carson, or solemn warning, or pity. Both are mingled here. Woe. Woe to you, Chorazin. When you hear Jesus damning, never hear Jesus just stuffing it in people's faces. There's a pity, even along with the condemnation. He would like to lift the damned out of it while they live. But what's amazing here is I want you to notice why these people are damned. There's no evidence that any of them were mass murderers. No evidence that there was a Hitler or a Pol Pot among them. They were simply damned because they would not listen to Jesus' music. They would not listen to the music he was bringing into the world. And Jesus, by the way, 
every preacher can learn from Jesus. He's the master illustrator, and he's not afraid of the most homely, down-to-earth illustrations. He doesn't need sophisticated illustrations. He gets an illustration from kids inviting other kids to play. Have you ever seen kids inviting other kids to play when the other kids don't want to play? It is one of the most debased pictures of humanity you ever saw. Hey, you want to play? No. You want to have fun? No. And uh, these kids that Jesus is talking about are playing a game I played as a kid, and then one that was a little darker than anything we played as a kid. They're playing weddings and funerals. And we definitely played weddings when I was a kid. And basically, Jesus says that this generation, this is verse 16, is like children sitting in a marketplace calling to their playmates, we played the flute for you, like you did at weddings, but you didn't dance. We sang a dirge, like you do at funerals. You didn't mourn. The idea is whatever music we played, we could change up the tune any way to you like, people would not respond. This is the measure of human depravity and sinfulness that whatever music Jesus comes to us with, we will not listen. And Jesus actually kind of se separates it, right? He says, John was the one playing the dirge. And we know John's ministry. It was, it was the same as Jesus, but maybe there was an accent, just like different churches in our day. Same idea, same gospel, but there's often a little different accent to where they, they put the emphasis on the wrong, or different syllables. And uh, John came playing a dirge. John came neither eating nor drinking. You weren't going to mistake him for a worldly charlatan. He didn't eat. He didn't drink. He was fasting all the time. And they didn't say, what a godly guy. We should listen to him. They said he has a demon. And then Jesus comes, same message, repent and believe, but he's healing people and having dinner with them and there's no one he won't eat with because he wants to just spread salvation to the most wicked and he'd love to be with them and bring them all the way to heaven. And what do they do with him? They say he's a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And the same is true today. People pass by fiery street preachers and they say, look how judgmental and intolerant these Christians are. Or they get invited over to a Christian's home and they get shown lots of grace and fed a nice meal and the gospel is shared with them and they say, ah, oh, intolerant and irrelevant fools. It doesn't matter how it's packaged. The message of salvation is not received by the ungodly. They're not responsive to that message. And for that, they are damned. Now, here's the thing you need to understand. Jesus regards ignoring his gospel as worse than paganism and worse than sexual perversion. There's a darker place in hell for those who've heard the gospel and rejected it than those who never heard it and never rejected it. There's a darker place in hell for those who knew biblical morality and rejected Christ than there is for sodomites who embraced perversion. Do you see Jesus saying that? He says, he says to Chorazin and Bethsaida, towns with synagogues in them, towns where they read the Bible, towns where they tried to have biblical standards. He says, Chorazin, so Chorazin and Bethsaida, it's going to be worse than it was for you than for Tyre and Sidon. And Tyre and Sidon were enemies of Israel in the Old Testament. They were pagan cities. And then he says, it's going to be worse for you, city in Israel, than it was for the arch evil city in the Old Testament, Sodom, where, they, where the men would clamor for homosexual sex outside of people's doors. Just rank perversion. Jesus says that when you've heard his truth and you've seen his miracles, you enter into a greater level of accountability and you get darker damnation if you reject it. You know, all the time I hear people say this, I've said this for years from the pulpit, I'll hear Christians and they'll talk about their, these friends they have who know biblical values, know some of God's truth, but they reject Jesus. And they talk about them all the time. This is how they talk about them. They're so close to the kingdom. 
They're not close to the kingdom. They're headed to the darkest pit of hell. It, it may be that the prostitutes and tax collectors you know are closer to the kingdom. And we need to be very careful in this day and age where we're politically so aligned with so many conservatives to recognize that being conservative and saying Judeo-Christian values form the basis of this nation, that is not a statement that gets you anywhere out of hell. That is a statement that will plunge you into a deeper judgment. You're acknowledging that you know something of Christ and you reject it. And all of this ought to fuel our evangelism. It ought to make us lean into our greatness. What makes me great? I know the truth. I know what can deliver you out of this darkness. I know about the one who died and rose again. I know not just about a boy being a boy and a girl being a girl. I know not just about what sound economic principles work. I know how to be saved from the wrath of God. That's what makes a person great. That and that alone. You know what will keep you from sharing that? Wanting to be great in other people's eyes with something other than that. Wanting to be politically respectable, culturally respectable, respectable to the right, respectable to the left, respectable to Muslim friends, respectable to Buddhist friends. If you want to be great based on something other than Jesus, you won't talk about Jesus. Because Jesus will threaten your greatness and theirs. But if you're walking through life like Paul, I got nothing. I got nothing. I'd be in the darkest pit of hell if it wasn't for Jesus, but I'm going to heaven because Jesus did everything to get me there. When you see that, that he died, that he rose again, that he ascended, he's at the right hand of the Father praying for you, keeping you, then you got something great to share with anybody. And you can see anybody rescued from any path they're on. So I would say to you, if you are here this morning and you have heard the gospel, oh, Emmanuel, children of Emmanuel, you have such a responsibility. Such light has been shown to you Sunday after Sunday. If you're here and you have heard the gospel, do not create the great, do not commit the great wickedness of rejecting Jesus. Come to Jesus. Trust in Jesus. And if you're a believer, recognize this. You have been given this great responsibility with a clarity that could only be dreamed of by the Old Testament prophets. You can proclaim Jesus in clarity to a watching world. You can say, who cannot get out of their mouths? He died. He rose again. And he paid for the sins of those who repent and believe in him. You must repent and believe in him. This is the greatest thing we can ever, this is what we were made for. This is what we should give ourselves to. This is what makes us great from the least to the greatest. Let's pray. Father, we come before you. We praise you for your grace. We pray and ask you that you would make us a people great because of our allegiance to the cross. Great because of our love for you. Great because of our stammering lips that get you out, even in all of our doubts and perfections. And we pray, Lord God, that you would bring those who are rejecting you out of the terrible evil and damnation they will face and into the kingdom of heaven, which will be eternal joy at God's right hand. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.